it's my birthday today and in honor of my all-time favorite film jaws i'm covering 10 movies that i'm saying are ripoffs of it even though they're just weird movies with sharks in them look look i i just want to see some silly shark things so sue me okay and hey since it's my birthday you can get me a gift by getting yourself a gift like maybe ordering my book timelines of terror or my movie the last Amityville movie, or even my new book, The 80s Project Volume 1. Um, each are available at the links below. But now, happy birthday to me, and farewell and adieu to you fair Spanish ladies. Number 10. We're going to start this off with one that I swore that I covered before, but I guess not. And it's 2016's Atomic Shark. I guess I maybe confused this, I don't know, with like Virus Shark or something. Or maybe like 100 other films that have a similar title. It starts with Oppenheimer's I Am Become Death speech. And I, and I checked to see if this was three hours long. And thank goodness, it's not. It does start with a woman water skiing being stalked by a large glowing red fin that eats her. We then meet a lifeguard with an injured leg that helps out via drone by delivering life jackets. And the lawnmower man is here. And so is the atomic shark. And it starts a munching. Genie here actually suspects that a radioactive shark may be out there and says that it'd be basically impossible to kill. And it makes a very public attack. Kaplan gets fired and fish keep washing up on the shore. And there's a restaurant critic uh, named Skip Forte. And he's played by Grift First, who's got a bunch of actors credits, but also a bunch of director's credits, and most of them are crazy sci-fi flicks. He did Swamp Shark, Arachno Quake, Ghost Shark, Alligator Alley, and I don't know, possibly some stuff that we're going to see a little bit later on this list. He eats the local fish and explodes into flame. And then Bud Bundy is on hand, and if you're like, oh man, poor David Faustino, another child actor that just sort of faded, guess what? He's been working really steadily with voice acting for cartoons, so he's doing pretty damn well. And when, when it comes to crazy shark flicks, th there's basically two categories, sci-fi and Tubi. And this one is the former, as you can probably tell by the little watermark on the lower left. And here's what I learned. The sci-fi ones have bold titles, but the films themselves are usually fairly formulaic and never really live up to the insanity of their name. The Tubi ones are usually much, much cheaper and sillier, and tend to be more enjoyable. And this one is in the former category, and it's by Ab Stone, whose only other movie is Lake Placid vs. Anaconda, also for sci-fi. And this is, uh, it's entertaining enough, but it, it's not really that wild, except for maybe a pretty hilarious live-action version of the old Bugs Bunny dynamite bit. Number nine, we're going even further back now, all the way back to 2008, which was really before all this crazy shark stuff went into full swing. And we're looking at Shark in Venice, which is apparently also called Sharks in Venice. So, so I guess it'll be a surprise if there's one shark or multiple appearing here. We're set in the Canal City and a diving crew is on a mission under the water and finds a lost section of the city, but they get attacked and eaten by, you guessed it, sharks in Venice, or maybe a shark in Venice. It's, it's hard to tell if one shark ate everyone or if there are multiple, and, and the suspense is just killing me. Meanwhile, in San Francisco, Barney Rubble is a teacher, and when his father dies, he heads overseas with his fiance, and his pops was one of the scuba guys. He declares that this is not a boat accident, and it wasn't a propeller, and it wasn't a coral reef, it wasn't Jack the Ripper. It was a shark. They start investigating what his dad was in search of, and it's Lost Medici Gold. And believe me when I tell you that Stephen Baldwin literally reads off every single line of dialogue as if he's under heavy sedation and about to have his wisdom teeth removed. They go diving, and there's a stock footage of sharks intercut that are clearly in an ocean and not in narrow canals. But then there's some Indiana Jones-style catacomb crawling 
So we get a bit of Jaws versus Tomb Raider action, I guess. But I guess subtract Lara Croft and insert a man increasingly on the edge of nodding off. And yeah, even though I don't think that this was a sci-fi one and it was more creative for the straight-to-video market, it sure does feel like a sci-fi film. And then it gives you the title Sharks in Venice and this pretty crazy poster. But it just feels so low-key. And, and maybe that's because it has a main character that is the equivalent of Donald Sutherland in the Body Snatchers remake when he's like, you can't show any emotion whatsoever, they'll know you're human. That's how Baldwin is acting in this film. If he shows any sort of human feelings whatsoever, they'll know that he is human. But he's really good at hiding it. Really good. What is it you're looking for? And you knew this might kill my father, didn't you? Where are you going? I'd like to say goodbye to Laura. Love you. I love you too. Please be careful. I will. Okay. All your men are dead, Clemenza. Number eight. Part of the fun of shark movies is the whole idea of, hey, that's not where sharks are supposed to be. And nowhere is that more apparent than 2017's Trailer Park Shark, which I guess is also called Shark Shock. It starts off in a river area and a weird explosion. Of course, there's a shark. It then flashes back and, and there's a little trailer park that's overseen by Rob here. And the inhabitants are all essentially just broad stereotype cartoon characters. But then there's Mr. Belding, who is the owner of the trailer park. He wants everyone out of there and has a plan to blow up the levee to drive everyone out. They blow it up and this guy is caught in the blast and I guess just straight up disintegrates? Like what, what happened to him? That shark is still there though, but Rob manages to electrocute it. Although considering that Rob is in the water with it, I'm not sure how he didn't feel any of the effects. But yeah, the whole park gets flooded out. And another shark shows up and starts the chomps. Oh, but then I guess it's the same shark and it survived the shock because electric eels exist? That's literally what they say. Rob says, how did it survive? And the woman says, you ever heard of electric eels? And that's it. We just now accept that the shark can be electric. And yeah, if you were wondering. Blew up. Mm -hmm. Completely? Or there are little parts of him floating around so somebody can identify him as an employee. Right? <laughs> oh, no. He pretty much vaporized on the spot. Good. And apparently, yep, uh, this shark can shock you. Hence, I guess, the title, Shark Shock. And for some reason, when this girl gets blasted, this happens. Which I guess was done for the blooper reel, but the director thought it was funny, so he kept it in the movie. And that director was Griff First. And, and remember when I said that he directed some crazy shark movies a bit ago? Well, this was one of them. And it has another veteran of shark flicks, since Tara Reid is here as well. There's a shark swimming in these waters. A shark here. The weatherman say nothing about a tornado. And based on all that, I, I don't think that you'll be surprised to know that this is another sci-fi channel, Shark Masterpiece, and it's clearly not taking itself all that seriously. And there's a fair amount of comedy here, even if a good chunk of it doesn't really land. Are you crazy? Or just stupid. It's a fine line. And it is. Number seven. Here's another example of that whole, hey, there should not be a shark there with 2018's Nightmare Shark, which had the far less interesting alternate title, Curse of the Dream Witch. It starts Freddy style with a woman in a dream-like state being attacked by water men and some sort of witch woman, and it affects her in the waking world? So Ava is having these bad dreams about uh, the ocean, and wait, 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 wait. Rob and Jolene from Trailer Park Shark are here, and their names are the same. So this is a sequel to that movie, I guess. But there's also Gina and Kaplan here, who were both from Atomic Shark. So we're looking at some sort of shared sci-fi cinematic universe here. And then Father Perez shows up, and he's the doc that is trying to cure this group of their bad dreams. Turns out that when Ava was a kid, a guy shot her family's boat, and she saw the witch in the water. And the rest of the fam was drowned. Rob decides he doesn't want to do it and leaves, only to be attacked on the road. And then there's just an effort made by the group to not fall asleep. And of course, 
They do, and have to face off dream attacks, and it very quickly slips into Elm Street ripoff land, going so far as to even do the whole hand out of the bathtub thing. And this is the third of the way through the movie, and we haven't even seen a shark yet, so I'm not sure why we're going with the title Nightmare Shark when it seems like Curse of the Dream Witch is way more fitting. And I, I guess it's appropriate that this is in some way a sequel to Trailer Park Shark since it was also written and directed by Griff first. And that makes three out of the four films that we've talked about so far that he was somehow involved in. And yes, this is another sci-fi entry, which should come as no shock. And there's definitely less comedy in this one than the previous, and way less sharp. What in the hell can I do? Just choke me until I pass out. And hey, wait. <laughs> what kind of movie is this? There's a point in which a character goes through files and we see information about the trailer park incident, but also the atomic shark stuff. And here's what's hilarious here. You get to the end of this movie and you're like, hold up, there was no shark in that movie. Like, at all. And that's because the Dream Witch version is a re-edit. The actual Nightmare Shark does have a giant shark in place of the witch. But I guess the film was altered, and the witch character digitally inserted instead of the big old CGI shark. And it seems like one was for the American market, the shark version, and one for the British market, the witch version. In Nightmare Shark, they explicitly state that the people were survivors of shark attacks, which makes sense. Whereas in the witch version, they all survived drowning? And that's just, it, the, the whole thing is just weird. Number six. Hopefully there will be a good deal more shark involved with 2022's Alien Shark. The opening gives us two girls on the beach and they find a glowing rock. And I have... No clue what is going on here. They, they are standing up to what appears to be their ankles in water. And I suppose something eats them. We then have a military woman named Alicia. And she's on a short leave. And goes off to an island with a group of friends. But uh-oh, there's an alien craft outside our atmosphere. And a shark with glowing green eyes eating people. But then to keep things complicated, there's mind-controlled people. And then this vagrant who talks to aliens on his walkie-talkie. He says that there's good ones and bad ones. And the bad ones are from a planet that's dried up and they've sent scouts here and attached them to predators. Hence the sharks, I, I guess. But there's good ones and they're trying to get him to help save the day. But then, to get even more complex, there's crystal rituals that seem to communicate with the sharks. And hey, guess what? You can get some stock shark footage and make the eyes green. But then there's also just like x-ray sharks floating in mid-air. Mid what, what the hell is going on here? What is, what is this movie? And I guess this movie is some sort of Walmart exclusive. And it looks like that means that the physical copies are only available at Walmart. But you can get it online pretty much anywhere. And it's on Tubi and whatnot. So what does Walmart exclusive even mean? It was directed by Paul Tombarello, and he has a pretty limited filmography, but the film he did right before this one had Amber Benson, Charisma Carpenter, and Claire Kramer in it, and, and I know that a solid chunk of people watching this list just lit up by that, but that same movie also had Luke Perry in it, so I guess just crossing universes. But then also, Miguel Nunez. I guess I, I, guess I should have watched that one instead. But you know, I say that, but then... This happens. That's right, this movie has a shark dog. Half shark, half dog. Big fins, big jaws. But the funny thing about the dog shark is that it's just so out of tone with everything else. This is actually a pretty slow paced flick where not much happens. Although everything tries to, it keeps on adding all of these different elements, but it never really does anything with them. But then, this little dog shark just randomly strolls in. But even then, they just kill it within a minute or two. And they don't even think it's weird. They call it like a, a guinea pig or something. This movie could have used more dog shark, or like, at least more stuff like dog shark. Because for the most part, this is really boring. Number five. So I, I called this list a ripoff list, although most of these films have little to do with Jaws outside of. There's a shark in it. 
But this one might actually qualify since it's 2012's Jaws of the Shark. It has some scientists realize that the shark that they're conducting tests on has escaped, and it shows up washed up on the shore where it starts attacking. There's then this family on a camping trip, and the shark starts attacking, and it's mutated now, and is this shark-man hybrid, and it does not have a visible zipper on the back of its suit. I don't know what you're talking about. It starts munching on dummies, and soon finds a lumberjack just cutting down trees with a chainsaw in the middle of the night for some reason. It kills him and takes his saw and then goes on a hilariously gory rampage. So, a young woman and a masked shark hunter decide to go on the case to take it out. The shark can drive a car and ends up getting cybernetic implants to make it virtually unkillable. And this is clearly leaning way into the comedy aspects of things and is doing a damn fine job of it. Not every bit it's doing is a winner, but there's enough to keep it really entertaining. The director is Gustav Lundahl, I don't know. And this was very early in his career, although he hasn't really done that much in the way of making films. But this was either made in Sweden or has a nearly entirely Swedish cast. And this one was probably done for about a tenth of the budget of the other films in this list so far. And keep in mind, all of those were pretty low budget as well. This is truly some backyard filmmaking here, but it's doing the right thing. It's being silly and over the top, but it's also doing so very earnestly and not playing things up like, oh, look how bad this is. Instead, it just is. And I know that this sort of thing doesn't appeal to everyone, but it definitely appeals to me. And it proves a theory that I never knew I had, but it's one that I'm making right now. And that's that almost anything is funnier when said with a Swedish accent. Number four. Well, I promised insanity, and here's where we would deliver, since now I'm checking out 2023's Puppet Shark. And as this begins, it's true to its name as it features puppets. Uh, Muppet-style puppets, actually. This guy has decided to propose to his girlfriend on the beach, and they go out on a boat together, but there's a shark. But not just any shark, a puppet shark. And, and you laugh. But this probably looks better than some of the effects in the other films, and the shark is more convincing. There's then a couple of campers, and they tell the story of the Canadian marshmallow shark, and it flashes back to the 60s, and gives us the origin of how, like, this shark likes marshmallows. But then there's another story about a dentist teaching a shark to floss. Uh, and, and so what this is, is a collection of short stories about sharks, all set to puppets, basically a little like anthology. And it's from someone who knows a thing or two about weird shark ripoffs, and it's Brett Kelly. Although this is listed as the director being the Kelly Collective. And I'm not totally sure what that means. Uh, judging from the other people in this film with the last name of Kelly, I'm thinking that this may have been involvement from other Kelly family members. And in case you're not familiar, I featured Brett Kelly on a number of other videos I've done, but if I focus it down to just the shark-related stuff, he's the director of Ouija Shark, the original Jurassic Shark, and of course, Raiders of the Lost Shark. But I have to tell you, this feels nothing like anything that he's done before. And it's actually kind of cute. Like the shark is literally a hand puppet and the stories are short and amusing, although it still ends up being a little all over the place. It sounds like some of the audio was recorded in a studio, and some of it was recorded in a big empty room, and it definitely makes you realize that puppeteering is not as easy as it looks when the mounts aren't matching the voices at all. But I, I don't care, this is a good time, and even though there's sharks eating people in it, it's done in a pretty wholesome way. Like if I had to guess, I would say that this is Kelly making a movie with his kids? and making it vaguely, vaguely kid-friendly, and it's worth a watch. Number three. Let's stay in 2022 and check out another one with a similar title, since we had Puppet Shark, but how about Doll Shark? This has a guy hunting a rogue shark that is said to be possessed by something evil, and he's standing in the ocean and not standing against a green screen. And he kills the shark and takes a tooth for a souvenir. He takes a stuffed shark from his kid's favorite TV show and puts the tooth inside of it for luck. 
and then ships it off. I guess it's then going meta since there's a podcast about people talking about killer doll movies and shark movies and bringing up the movie Doll Shark. And this lady says this. I think that kids are getting soft. I think that they need things to toughen them up a little bit. If anyone says this, just discount their opinion totally. Kids today have regular active shooter drills. So maybe, I don't know, shut up. The doll shark comes to life and eats a dog and yep, two movies in a row where the shark is a stuffed toy. Go figure. But then, when Kirby's mom goes out of town and he's left with a jerky babysitter, the doll transforms into this more menacing version and chows down on the neighbors. So, if you've seen enough of these, you'll spot Jamie Morgan, Danielle Donahue, and now Titus Himmelberger. So this is definitely a Polonia jammer. Oh, this one was one he only co-directed and was also partially handled by his son, Anthony Polonia. Anthony has done a few different films now following in his dad's footsteps, and I previously covered his Zilla Foot and Hell on the Shelf, but this is his first shark flick. I think this is kind of funny because there's clearly some Jaws riffs in there since there's a missing dog named Pippin, and the shark started out in the town of Amity, and a local news report instead shows a Chiron that says Amityville, um, and then Mark makes a cameo, as does Ken Van Sant. And you know, I like to check out the IMDb trivia pages for stuff to talk about when it comes to these movies. And for this page, it looks like someone had a little fun. It says that Dave Fife, one of the actors here, was considered for the role of James Bond when Piers Brosnan quit but lost out to his good friend Daniel Craig. And then it also says that Kevin Coolidge, another actor, had competed in over 20 Special Olympics and was motivated to enter the acting world after seeing Sean Penn in I Am Sam. But... Yeah, I normally don't like Anthony's stuff as much as I do Mark's, but this one has that feel, and I enjoyed it quite a bit. And that shark puppet is just great. I mean, I realize that it's literally a stuffed animal, but I don't care. It's lovely. Number two. Speaking of Brett Kelly and Jurassic Shark, there was a sequel to that one that I covered a while back called Jurassic Shark 2, Aquapocalypse, and that was directed by Mark Polonia. And well, he went back there with 2023's Jurassic Shark 3, Seavenge. It begins with a sort of recap of the previous two films through a news report, and the first film had to do with a stolen painting and the criminals that took it, and they were eaten by the Megalodon that's just in the water there. And, and we meet their accomplices, and one is Polonia regular Kyle Rapoport, and there's also Jamie Morgan again. There's also Mark himself playing a photographer and an aspiring model. And then it's a basic replay of the first movie as the thieves try to find the location of the sunken painting while innocents are swept up in their deeds. And the shark prowls and eats, uh, I, I guess. At one point, Mark's character falls into the water and it's very, very clearly not the lake that they're on. It's a swimming pool. And I say this very clearly because the water is very clear, unlike the water out here. And then the shark, I think, is attacking him. But since the water is so clear, it's, it's pretty easy to see that nothing is around him. And, and like I said, this one is also from Polonia. But this version is without his son and was one of nine films that he released in 2023. It, it, it wasn't even his only shark film of the year either, since he also put out Cocaine Shark. Oh, although I've already covered that one elsewhere. And I have to admit, this one didn't hit like the Polony Pony usually does. It suffers from a little too much of padding things out repeatedly. And when it comes across as just a, like a repeat of the first film stretched out into the full runtime, it wears out its welcome. I do admire the cheese and the silliness of some of it, though. And the shark destroying the helicopter is precisely what I love this stuff for. And for some reason, the ending suddenly becomes a sequel to Sharkenstein and even has Jeff Kirkendall return as the mad scientist from that film, even though he, he died there. And then our heroine fights it in a forklift. And when they do the long shot, like, like this is very obviously Ken Van Sant there, uh, that man is distinctive as hell. Number one. Speaking of Brett Kelly and Ouija Shark, I guess there was a trend to take his shark movies and then have someone else 
handle the sequel because in 2022 that was Ouija Shark 2. There's a recap of the first film talking about the spirit shark unleashed by a Ouija board by Jill and her friends and her dad, Anthony, helped her out and was killed, but his ghost then pitched in to finish it off. Anthony is now narrating the film and says that he's in hell and his wife is here and goes to the mystic woman from the first film played by the same actress in search of Jill. Meanwhile, Anthony is in hell and for some reason fights gorillas in sunglasses, but he now has like Dr. Strange like powers. I mean, I don't know what's going on here, but I approve. He finds out that there's another entity in hell that controls the Ouija shark. And sure enough, there's this guy named Kaldura that's a demon and feeds the shark bikini girls to keep it under control. He says that the Ouija shark's defeat in the first film led to him losing power in hell, so he hates Anthony. For some reason, that leads to a, a, a musical number. You can roast a weenie over a kitten, but why? With me, Kaldura in charge. Anthony meets up with Death himself, who says that he's not really dead and says that the shark is actually a problem and asks him to stop it for him. And here's my best shot of explaining all of this. John Miglior, who has appeared in a pretty large number of low-budget backyard flicks, has also directed several of his own. He appeared in the first Ouija Shark and I guess decided that he really liked his character in it and he built the sequel around him. And it should be noted that he did co-write the first one as well. This has that standard sort of like vanity project side effect of the writer director making himself the lead of the film and then having that character just sort of be the coolest and best guy around that other characters talk highly of at every opportunity. And, and I'm not saying that the first one took itself seriously because it definitely knew what it was. But this one has full on kaiju sized Ouija sharks and demons and really goes over the edge. And it's pretty damn fun. Sure, it occasionally suffers from the side effects of trying too hard to be goofy, and the acting definitely misses the mark. And there's this attempt to shift away from the killer shark vibe uh, part of the story of this one to kind of like a superhero story instead. But I like this quite a bit. I mean, the ending has a fight between a giant Ouija shark and Tarot Gator. So what, what's not to like? So there you have it. Happy birthday to me. Ten silly shark movies, most of which were pretty fun. I actually enjoyed the, the bulk of these. Some of them were a little on the like slower side with not as much exciting as I would have hoped. But for the most part, I had a good time watching these, as I usually do with goofy shark movies. It's a lot of fun. Let me know which of these you've seen. Uh, let me know other crazy shark movies down below in the comments. I want to hear that. If you enjoyed the video, hit the like button. If you enjoy the channel, hit that subscribe button and hit the bell to get notified when new videos go up. And also check out my Patreon page at patreon.com slash movie timelines where you can become a patron of this channel and help support it. But you can also keep coming back and watching more videos. I appreciate that as well. And I'll see you very shortly for another great one. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.